So today I'm going to talk to you about the impact of being bullied in childhood on the development of mental health problems. And from this talk today, I would like you to remember four uh, points. And I will flag them up as I, as I go along. The first thing I would like to remember, I would like you to remember, is what is bullying. And this is a definition that we've used when we assess bullying in groups of children. So we say a student is being bullied when another student or a group of students say or do nasty and unpleasant things to him or her. It is also bullying when a student is teased repeatedly in a way that he or she doesn't like. But it's not bullying when two students of about the same strength quarrel or fight. Now, there are three important things that distinguish bullying from other forms of victimization. And the first one is that bullying takes place between people of about the same age. So it takes place between young children, it takes place between teenagers or adolescents, or it can take place between adults, as we all know. However, it doesn't cross the age group. So when an adult is being abusive towards a child, we don't call it bullying. We would call it maltreatment. So bullying is a, peer, a form of peer victimization. Bullying takes place repeatedly over time. So a one-off incident on the playground or at home is not necessarily bullying. Bullying has to happen repeatedly so that there's a pattern of interaction that takes place between the children who bully and the victims. And finally, bullying takes place between people where you have a power imbalance, whereby it's much more difficult for the victims to defend themselves. And this power imbalance may take different form. So it can be in terms of strength, so someone much stronger being abusive toward a child who's weaker. Or it can be in terms of number, so having a group of kids being nasty towards a child. Or it can also be um, expressed in different kind of more subtle form, like being very smart. So a child who's very bright, who would be abusive towards a child who's um, intellectually challenged. Or in terms of popularity. So a child who's extremely popular, who will exclude a child um, who has more difficult social relationships. So not everything is bullying. Bullying is a very specific form of peer victimization. And you may wonder, why shall we bother about bullying if it's so specific? Well, there are several reasons why I think that we should be concerned about bullying. And first of one, I've listed some reasons, and I will not explain them all. Um, but one of the things that I would want to highlight is that being bullied in childhood or adolescence is quite common. So it's difficult to pin down one prevalence rate because it does vary across countries. It does vary across ways that we've measured bullying. Um, but if I had to um, make an average across all the numbers that I've, um, I've saw, I would say that overall about 20% of young children uh, or young people would report having been the victim of bullying at some stage in their life. So it is something quite common and it matches as well the prevalence of child maltreatment. Um, one thing which may be surprising is that bullying can be persistent over time. So we would think quite often that being bullied is um, about being at the wrong place at the wrong time However, some research tends to suggest that even despite the change from primary school to secondary school, some children um, are chronically bullied. And also a research from um, Germany has shown that only 7% of young children in secondary school are bullied for the first time. So most of the kids who are bullied later in life have been bullied um, earlier in life. 
I also wanted to point out that it knows, uh, bullying knows no boundaries. So the research on bullying started in Scandinavian countries with Daniel Weyes, who kind of really started the research on, on bullying. And now, um, lots of research across um, the world. So recently, there was a report from the World Health Organization who kind of investigate the prevalence of, of bullying around uh, across 40 countries in, in the world. And finally, I just want to point out as well that uh, bullying tends to evolve with its time. So I'm sure that you heard about cyberbullying, which is a form of um, abuse behavior that ch um, children are using. So uh, focusing on social media, the internet, or mobile phones. Some people kind of think that this is the worst thing ever in life. Um, but actually, the findings tend to show that it's not necessarily kind of worse than any other form of more traditional uh, bullying. But this is a new way for young children to be nasty to each other. So I think that we have to be very careful and monitor what's going on with um, children and their use of, of social media and the um, internet. Okay, so that was my first point. So that you know um, what bullying is and what it's important. And based on this, lots of people have decided or have assumed that it means that being bullied causes mental health problems. However, lots of the study design that have been used didn't allow for such conclusion. So the link between being bullied and mental health problems has not been really kind of tested properly until um, fairly recently. And one of the two points that is important when you want to test for, I would not say causal because um, I'm studying epidemiology studies, so it's observational studies, I cannot really um, um, talk about causality. But if we want to really assess the extent to which being bullied in childhood contribute to development of mental health problems, we need to do two important things. And one of them is to control for prior mental health problems to make sure that it's not that kids who have mental health problems were more likely to be bullied instead of being bullied leading to mental health problems. And also we have to control for lots and lots of different confounding factors. And I focused in my past research on um, confounding factors that can ex that are shared by people growing up in the same family. Um, as we know, being uh, growing up in a poor environment, um, suffering from deprivation, having um, parents who have psychopathology or witnessing um, violence in the home could both lead to children being bullied and also developing mental health problems. So we need to rule out the possibility that these factors that are shared by people in the same family do not explain that link there. And another possibility is that genetic factors may explain the risk for being bullied and also having uh, mental health problems. So I tried to rule out this hypothesis using a twin study, and I will describe it very um, briefly. It's called the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Twin Study, and it's a cohort of 2,232 twins, same-sex twins, who were born between 1994 and 1995 in England and Wales. And we started visiting um, the families doing home visits when the twins were age five, again at age seven, at age 10, age 12. And last time we saw them, they were age um, 18. And one of the nice features of the e-risk study is that it has a very low attrition rate. So despite all these years, we still have 93% of the cohort who still take part in our assessment. So we conducted analyses controlling for these confounding factors, so the genes and the shared environment, using regression model. Um, and I will go, not go into much detail about the statistical aspect of that, but if you have any questions, you may ask later. 
But what I want to do is to illustrate the fact that using this um, a very neat natural experiment, which we call the monozygotic twin discordant design, we managed to kind of really show that being bullied in childhood contributed to the development of mental health uh, problem by controlling for all these factors. The analyses were conducted on all the twins, the, our samples of 2,000 twins, but I want to show you an illustration because it's easier to kind of explain based on this um, graph that I will show you. So that is my second point I would want you to remember is that being bullied in childhood does contribute to mental health problems. So we contrasted monozygotic twins, so those monozygotic twins are genetically identical and they grew up in the same environment. And we've identified 114 pairs of twins, monozygotic twins, where one twin has been bullied and the other one not. And these uh, were being bullied by the age of seven and we've looked at their emotional problems at age 10. And what we found was that the twin who's been bullied have higher rates of emotional problems compared to their co-twins who haven't been bullied. Because these two groups are identical genetically and because the twins share their own family environment, we know that these factors cannot account for the differences in emotional problems between these twins at age 10. Also, we've controlled for prior emotional problems, so at age five, when the twins were age five, so prior to the experience of being bullied, and despite that, the differences um, remain. So using this discordant twin design, we can uh, make strong um, inference on causality, although it's not causality, but it is strong support for um, showing that being bullied in childhood does contribute to mental health uh, problem, despite all these factors, and also despite prior mental health uh, problems. So this study was published in 2008, so 10 years ago. Um, and I want to reassure you that there's nothing specific in our study of twins to come up with those um, findings. Just recently, in the past two years, um, we have two twin studies who replicated our finding, one of them being another cohort of twin in the UK, um, but the other one, um, do I have a pointer on this? I think that this might be one, yes. So this is another cohort of, um, of twins in the UK uh, of about the same age. And this one is from the US. Um, and it has um, also data from the twins as they, um, as they get older. So we, are, we have three studies using the same um, study design, using different measures. Um, but still, they corroborate in showing um, very strongly using a strong study design that being bullied in childhood does lead to mental health um, problem. And altogether, oh yes, um, I just wanted to show you here um, some of the findings from the American cohort. So you can see here that um, the monozygotic twins who's been bullied have increased risk of having social um, anxiety and separation anxiety as well compared to their co-twins who, who haven't been bullied. And one thing which is quite amazing is this kind of high risk for ADHD. So far with all the research that I did, um, the risk um, for being bullied is much stronger for emotional problems. So symptoms of anxiety and depression, and it seems to be kind of um, weaker for any externalizing problems. So conduct disorder, alcohol abuse, um, including ADHD as well. So that is quite interesting. Altogether, these studies really support any action or interventions that we have um, in trying to stop bullying behaviors in the school, in the communities, or even in the family. So if we reduce bullying behaviors, we should be able to reduce mental health problems in young people. Uh, in the UK, that is where all the money and all the energy goes. So we're really focusing on stopping those abusive behaviors among young children. However, there's some study that shows that those interventions are not 
entirely successful, and on average, we can reduce bullying behavior by 20% by using those um, interventions. So the possibility of completely eradicating, eradicating uh, bullying behavior uh, in the schools is probably quite small. So my sense is that there will always be victims um, of bullying. So one of the questions that um, came up to my mind is that what if this is not enough? Stopping bullying behavior is not enough to try to control mental health problems associated with bullying. And one way of showing that was to see whether mental health problems associated with being bullied in childhood would last longer, uh, would persist even after bullying has stopped. And to be able to test for that, I had to turn towards another research uh, population cohort that we have in the UK, and it is called the National Child Development Study, otherwise known as the, as the 1958 uh, British cohort. And it's a cohort of everyone who was born um, in England um, and Wales in Great Britain in one week in 1958. So if ca you calculate quite quickly, you will find out that this year all those study members are 60 years old. And today I will show you findings up until age 50 only. But this is a very rich data sources that we have in the UK and it's publicly available. So anyone, Anyone in this room, if they wanted to um, use the data, you could, if you have a good idea, and you submit your project. So in that study, we have prospective measures of bullying victimization reported by the parents when the participants were age 7 and 10. And as we followed them up, we've looked at mental health outcomes at age 45 and age 50. As you can imagine, I told you that the e-risk study is beautiful because we have a low attrition rate. In a study like this one, attrition rate is much more important, so we account for that using weights in our analyses. What we've shown was that at age 23, so 12 years later after being bullied, we, we do see variation in um, psychological distress amongst the participants. And you can see here, those who were, whoop, and though, well, anyway, um, those who were occasionally or frequently bullied have higher levels of psychological distress compared to those who haven't been bullied. And you can see that the effect is there for both women and men, but the effect is stronger for the women. Now, we've looked at age 50, so 39 years after experiencing bullying, and what you can see is that the effect is still there. You can see an overall increase of psychological distress from 23 to 50, but you can see that there is variation, again, according to um, bullying uh, victimization. And the effect is still there for both males and females separately, but we don't have the gender difference um, anymore. So I know that this is a, a congress of psychiatrists, and people in the room may not really believe or um, um, believe or have faith in this concept of psychological distress, which we can observe in the population. And you may want to have diagnosis. Um, and we had that in the um, cohort, so in a subgroup of people in the uh, NCDS, um, we did uh, assess psychiatric disorders, and you can see that the findings are the same when you use um, diagnosis. You can see that those who were occasionally or frequently bullied have more depressions, a higher risk of having depression. Those who were frequently bullied have higher risk of anxiety. And um, anyone who's been bullied have a higher risk of suicidality. So that is at age 45. And of course, in those analyses, I try to control for all those confounders. This is not a twin study. So I cannot control for genetics, but I did try to control for as many childhood factors as I could. So including parental SES, uh, parental socioeconomic status, um, low IQ, other form of uh, adversity, including child maltreatment and parental divorce, being placed into care as well. And of course, we control for behavioral and emotional problems in childhood as well. The effect is not 
that big, so there is 39 years between exposure and the outcome. But the striking finding from this study is that the differences are still there at age um, 45 and at age 50. Another striking thing that we discovered in our study is that the effect of being bullied in childhood is not limited to mental health problems. So you can see that as adults, those kids who were bullied um, are less likely to be or underrepresented in those with higher degrees um, at school, and they are overrepresented among those with no qualification um, when they are, they are at age 50. There's also an association with social relationships, so you can see that those who were either occasionally or frequently bullied are more likely to live without a spouse or a partner, and they're less likely to perceive support among their friends when they are um, sick. There's also an effect on biology, the way that the body is functioning. So we've looked specifically at markers of inflammation when the study participants were age 45. And you can see that those who were occasionally or frequently bullied have higher levels of CRP, so C-reactive protein. And even when we try to disentangle those with extremely high levels of C-reactive protein, those who were bullied are uh, overrepresented in those groups. And when we look at a different form of uh, indicator, another indicator of inflammation, you can see that the effect is there as well. And the other biological marker that we've looked at was obesity at age 50. And you can see that you have a marked difference um, across bullying um, amongst the women. So the women who were either frequently or occasionally bullied in childhood were at increased risk of being obese at age 50. And of course, once again, I control for lots of different factors um, in childhood, but also some um, adult lifestyle as well, such as doing exercises and eating um, habits. But the effects um, are still there. And finally, the last analysis that we did in relation to the long-term effect of bullying was to look not just at individual effect, but looking at societal effect. And we've looked using still NCDS. We've looked at um, the risk for using mental health um, services up to midlife among people who were bullied in childhood. And you can see that the risk is quite high for those who were frequently bullied. So um, they were using, more likely to use mental health services at age 16. And you have a steep kind of decrease. Um, but still at age 50, the risk remain um, significant. So they're more likely at age 50 to kind of use mental health services. And this risk is made out of two groups, people who were using services from childhood and they are still using it up until age 50, but also people who started using um, mental health services up until age um, 33. We don't have any new uh, people using services um, at age um, 42. So those who were bullied in childhood more likely to um, keep on using mental health services up to midlife. So the last point, no, the third point I would want you to remember is that the effect of being bullied in childhood seems to persist over time. So maybe what we're doing is not enough. And in addition to focusing on reducing bullying behavior, we may also need to focus on providing support and help for the children who were bullied for making sure that they don't develop mental health um, problems. So this is a bit of a controversial idea. So we organized a policy lab, and a policy lab is kind of bringing a question to a group of people who are interested in this case in bullying. And you have people, teachers, people from the government, um, people um, doing research um, on bullying. And we kind of ask the question, is, would that be a good idea to, um, to probably um, help those kids who've been bullied in trying to reduce um, their risk for developing mental health problems and to expand the focus of um, anti-bullying intervention. So what we've proposed um, was um, two different intervention and one of them was to focus on um, 
some children in preventing them from becoming the victims of bullying. So we know that there are a set of factors that make some children more likely to be bullied, one of them being having mental health problems, another one being you know, having a genetic predisposition to kind of being bullied as well. So if we intervene on those factors, maybe we could break um, the cycle of violence by preventing those children from being bullied in the first place. And those interventions could be um, school-wide, so we could provide the skills um, to all the children and making sure that they don't become bullied, and we could have more targeted interventions for those that we know are a little bit more at risk of being bullied. And the other intervention focusing on the victims would be to build resilience in those children who didn't escape bullying. So they've been bullied um, and we can make them stronger in the face of adversity to prevent them from um, developing those mental health problems. And I just want to finish with this last slide just to give you some kind of positive message after <clears throat> being a little bit negative um, throughout all the findings I've just shown you. But I would want to kind of um, just tell you that we did investigate resilience in our twin study. Um, and we found that um, those children who were bullied were who benefit from a very loving and caring relationship with their mom were less likely to have both behavioral and emotional problems as a result of being bullied. So you can see here that you have emotional problems at age 10, uh, at age 12, I think. And here you have behavioral problems. And you can see here that those kids who've been bullied have higher emotional problems and higher behavioral problems compared to those who were not bullied. But within that group of kids who were bullied, those who had high maternal warmth had lower emotional problems compared to those who didn't have such a good relationship with their parents. Therefore, having a good and warm and loving and caring relationship with mothers in our case, that's what we have, but I think that we can probably expand to lots of different relationships for the kids, so probably it's the same for the father, it is the same for the sibling as well, and maybe for grandparents as well, extended family. But it seems that having or benefiting from these positive relationships seems to prevent or reduce the risk of having mental health problems when you didn't uh, manage to escape bullying victimization. So that would be my last uh, message that I would want you to remember is that we may not be able yet to completely eradicate bullying behavior, but we do have ways to prevent young children who've been bullied in making sure that they don't develop mental health um, problems.